good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us in this virtual setting today. Um, my name is Peter Strong. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm co-director at Racing Magpie here in Minaluzaha or Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, where we support native creatives and community through striving to be good relatives. We offer contemporary native art gallery, affordable studios, um, flexible creative community spaces, and a whole bunch of programs that we hope are connecting and supporting all of the incredible creativity in our area and our region. Uh, my partner, Mary Bordeaux, and I have two sons, Austin, who's 25, and Chanti Nupa, who's 13. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we were, I was introduced properly. I'm joined here by um, Janine Burnett from uh, the Minnesota Native Indigenous Business Alliance, and I just wanted to create some space for you to, to introduce yourself if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And hello, everyone. It's so good to have you join us. My name is Janine Burnett. I'm the co-executive director at the nonprofit organization Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance. We're based here um, in St. Paul, Minneapolis area. And we work, I work closely as a newbie. I work closely with the founder of this organization. Her name is Pamela Standing. She's the other co-executive director and honored to work with her in this endeavor to get this promoted today and, and um, talk more about this. And we also work closely with Gracie Horn, who's um, leading the Minnesota Native Artists Alliance, which is a program of Maniba. And so just want to do a shout out to her and Candice and um, for um, helping with this event today and for Skylar, who's managing all the IT. So thank you. We're excited to um, talk more about this. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Janine. And uh, so just to give you all a little background about why we're here uh, before I hand it over to Connor, who you see on the screen too. Uh, a couple months ago, we at Racing Magpie became aware of some proposed revisions to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, uh, which is the act that focuses, a federal act that focuses on truth and advertising around native made artwork. Because this act directly affects native artists from our community and around the country, and because we knew that most of them might not be aware of, of the revisions and maybe not even the act, uh, we wanted to hold some virtual space where we could help present some of the basic information about the act and the revisions and make sure that Native artists are able to ask questions and talk things out together. Uh, by doing this, we hope to increase our collective awareness of the act and revisions uh, and for us all to be more informed when submitting our feedback to the federal government about these proposed revisions. Uh, we did, Racing Magpie did a, 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 and invited Connor. Connor was gracious enough to come present at a um, virtual event, what, a month ago or so. And um, we reached out to our friends at, at Maniba and Minnesota Native Artists Alliance and we were able to come together to do this again and hopefully keep reaching more people. Um, so for today, we're gonna, uh, first we're gonna hear from Connor McMahon, who's the chief curator of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board Museums. Connor is gonna talk about the basics of the current act and, and a, do an overview of the proposed revisions as well. And then once he's done, we're gonna open up the, the, the virtual floor to questions and comments from all of you and we're going to try and have a loose, dis friendly discussion about what you're asking, what's on your mind, what are your comments and questions. And uh, we shoot, we'll probably shoot on giving that discussion at least 30 minutes. And if it if it's still going strong, we can keep it going um, a little bit longer. And if you have questions anywhere along the way, uh, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, just make the comment there. We'll see them. If you're joining us any other way, just Put the comments in and we'll we'll um, share them when the time is right. Without any other delay, I want to um, clear the, the space for Connor uh, to introduce himself and and share his presentation with us all. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I certainly appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to be here and all the work that Racing Magpie and Maniba have done to organize this. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to be here and uh, hopefully 
share some information with artists and encourage some discussion about these uh, proposed new regulations to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Um, and as I said, my name is Connor McMahon. I'm the uh, uh, senior curator, chief curator um, with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Um, I have been here about 10 years. I'm based in Rapid City, South Dakota as well too, um, and oversee the three museums that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board operates in the Great Plains regions. Um, and work very closely with our central office in Washington, D.C., um, which is responsible for implementation and administration of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Um, the, uh, the act itself is actually quite an old law. It goes back to 1935, but there have been multiple revisions. And uh, there is now a proposed new set of regulations to go along with the act. Um, that would have a significant impact on that. So uh, I'm here to share some information um, and encourage artists to learn more about it and give feedback. And um, we'll, I think with that, we could probably move into uh, the slides. Oh, that's the last one. We want to back up to the first one. Perfect. All right. Um, so uh, in this, I'm just going to touch on the current regulations and kind of explain the act as it is now um, and how that applies to uh, Native artists and then touch on some of the highlights of the proposed new regulations. And um, just to kind of give everybody a little bit of background, even with 10 years in the federal government, I'm still kind of learning about uh, laws and regulations. Um, and essentially, the act itself was a bill that was introduced by Congress, right? And then um, once a bill is passed by Congress, it's up to the various federal agencies to actually write the regulations of how that um, bill works on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, right now we're not talking about a revision to the bill itself. We're talking about just the regulations and how that plays out on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can move to the next slide. Perfect. Um, so the act, we love acronyms in the federal government. So we all, we refer to it as IACA. You'll see that um, in some of our publications and resources as well too. Um, but as Peter mentioned, it is essentially a truth and advertising law is the easiest way to think about it. Um, and under the current act, it says it is unlawful to offer or display for sale um, or sell any product um, that falsely suggests it's an American Indian or Alaska Native product. Um, and we'll use specific terms here, um, like Alaska Native, American Indian, and Native American. Um, and when I refer to those terms, we're just really discussing them in the, the context of the act um, and their, their legal meaning and legal terminology. Um, so essentially, um, it, in a nutshell, to sell something as Native American made, it actually has to be made um, by uh, uh, one of just a, a select group of people. So an enrolled member of a federally or state recognized tribe um, or uh, enrolled member of an Alaska Native village, an Alaska Native corporation, or an Alaska Native claim settlement. Um, and then the final group is a um, certified American Indian artisan. Um, and that is a, a group that um, was added to the act essentially to allow each tribe the sovereignty to decide um, who they want to grant the ability uh, to sell under the act. Um, and so I think the, the sort of basis behind the act um, is that it's not the federal government trying to necessarily dictate who can sell or market their goods as Native American. It's saying to each tribe, you set your own definitions for enrollment. Um, and as long as people meet those definitions, then they're able to sell or market their work um, under the act. And the certified Indian artisan category is, is sort of the uh, alternative there, where if a tribal government or council um, decides that there are individual artisans who they who they still want to be able to sell their their artwork as Native American, even if they don't meet enrollment criteria. Then that's a process by which each tribe um, can develop its own procedures for granting permission to those artisans. All right, I think we're ready for the next slide. Perfect. Um, so the current, um, how do we define Indian products under the current? 
uh, IACA regulations. Um, and it's a fairly limited um, group of items. And the easiest way to think of it are handmade arts and crafts products. Um, so virtually uh, anything within that category, um, you know, whether it's paintings, drawings, illustrations, pottery, um, all many of the common things that we would think of um, are, are the products that can be sold as Indian products under current IACA regulations. Um, another key component that you'll see here in the block of text on the left um, is that the labor used to produce that product, um, it must be Indian labor as defined as an Indian is defined under the act, right? Um, so it can't be a mass produced product. Um, it cannot be made by uh, individuals who are not enrolled tribal citizens or certified um, Indian artisans. So keep that in mind as we kind of move through and talk, and that'll, that'll um, uh, come into play later when we talk about these proposed revisions. Um, uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention here, um, that's fine, we'll, we're good there, um, is, yeah, um, is that there's no definition of whether it has to be a traditional or non-traditional style, right? So again, um, the Department of the Interior is not trying to say what particular type of art um, it can be made. You know, it doesn't have to be a tr something traditional like quill work. Um, it could be um, very, you know, innovative and modern. Um, all that's permitted under the Act as is. All right, thanks. We can go to the next slide now. Okay. Um, and uh, just to kind of touch on, again, uh, who can produce um, the Indian made products under the um, current IACA regulations um, and how it's defined under the act, right? Um, and again, uh, an enrolled member of a federally or state recognized tribe um, and Indian artisan means an individual who is certified by any Indian tribe um, as a non-member Indian artisan. And then there's also another group, which is Indian arts and crafts organizations. Um, and that uh, is any legally established arts and crafts organization in which the members are composed of uh, enrolled tribal members. Um, so again, a fairly tightly defined criteria under the existing act. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, and then what are, excluded. And again, the current act um, is pretty specific about what cannot be sold or marketed as an Indian product um, under the law. So these are just a few examples, not necessarily all inclusive, um, but it, you cannot sell something in the style of an Indian art or craft product made by non-Indian labor. Um, you cannot sell something that has been designed by an Indian, but produced by non-Indian labor. Um, you cannot sell something that has been produced from a kit, um, and those are readily commercially available. So um, even if it is even if it is made by um, uh, Indian or Native American labor, if it's assembled from a kit, that doesn't qualify as a, a Native American product under the current act. Um, and it also cannot be a commercially made product, so a mass produced product, unless there is substantial transformation um, provided by Indian labor. Um, and a good example I always like to use for that is, you know, we've seen some incredible beaded uh, Chuck Taylors, right? We have some wonderful ones in the collection here um, at the museum. That certainly would qualify um, as an Indian made product because it has been substantially transformed. Um, that definition I understand can be a little bit vague, you know, what qualifies as substantial transformation, um, and those are handled on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think um, it's a fairly common sense uh, uh, standard that, that the board would apply to that. Um, so if you've uh, essentially turned it into a new product, certainly qualifies and no issues there. Um, in, oh, go back, I got a couple more things on that one. Um, industrial products um, is another big category uh, that I wanted to touch on that cannot be sold. Um, so an exclusively functional 
purpose, right? It, it, that's not a piece of art or a piece of craft work. Um, and, and examples included here are appliances and vehicles, but those are just, I mean, it could be uh, other examples um, might be even, you know, mass produced clothing, um, things of that nature. Um, and then uh, the one last category um, are, are things that are made sort of mass produced in an assembly line fashion um, where some of the labor might be Indian, but some might be not. Um, so that mixture of of Indian um, work and labor with non is not permitted um, under the current act. And the example here, right, is, uh, you know, if 20 people are together making a product and the last person, say a piece of pottery, right, uh, uh, being mass produced and the last person who decorates it is an enrolled tribal member, um, that still cannot count as an Indian product under the existing act. Okay, now we're ready for the next one, thanks. So um, the, the proposed new regulations, essentially the way they work, and we'll provide links to the full regulations, they're 18 pages long, and I know that's a lot to digest. It's taken me a lot to digest all of this. Um, it keeps the existing um, categories that allow individual artisans um, to make or sell their work. So, you know, if you're a painter or a sculptor or a potter or a beadworker or or what have you, um, essentially on a day-to-day -day basis with your work, nothing is going to change. What the new regulations do change is they create a, a new category of organizations that can sell their products as Indian made products under the act. And that category is defined under these new regulations um, as Indian businesses. And those regulations do spell out the criteria um, for these Indian businesses to be able to sell or market their products um, as Indian made products. Um, and there are four criteria that you can see up here on the screen. Um, so it must be incorporated or formed under federal, state, or tribal law, just like any other business. Um, two, it must be at least 50% owned by an Indian or Indians or a tribe. Three, um, an Indian, you know, same group, Indian, Indians, or Indian tribe must receive at least 50% of the earnings from the business. And four, management and daily operations of the business must be controlled by one or more Indians. Um, there's another provision for these businesses that's in there, and that is that final assembly or processing of the product must occur in the United States. Um, and any significant processing that goes into the product must occur in the United States. And all or virtually all of the ingredients or components of the product must be made and sourced in the United States. Um, and that could get a little bit tricky, I think, too, when um, you're talking about products like beadwork, right? Uh, most, of, most of the glass beads, for example, that might be used in beadwork are not going to be made in the United States. So um, it remains to be seen how that those proposed regulations um, might play out. So the big takeaways um, from, from this new group here are under this category, it removes the requirement that Indian labor must be used to produce these goods. Um, so essentially the labor of any individual um, can now be used to produce these goods. Um, and then the other um, big change is that this group, the Indian business group, um, they would be able to apply for the use of a trademark with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Um, and that trademark um, would basically be a 
design, which is still currently being developed. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is administering a process, um, requesting submissions for what this trademark would be graphically, right? Um, and it would essentially be a tag, a stamp, a label that these businesses could affix to their product um, that would display the words certified Indian product, um, possibly certified Indian product by Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Um, so you can see this is a fairly complicated process. Um, and also um, there within the regulations are explanations for the process by which a business can apply for this certification. Um, and I apologize, I, I'm missing a slide here on that, but it's in the regulations and I just wanted to explain it a little bit. Um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board currently maintains something we call the source directory um, of American Indian artists and businesses. And I'm sure many of you as artists are familiar with artist directories, that's essentially what it is. Um, right now, the directory, it's a, it's a free um, resource that we provide um, for Native American artists, enrolled tribal members, and um, the, the other category of uh, arts organizations in which all members are Native Americans. Uh, it's on the Indian Arts and Crafts Board website. Um, and it's a, a straightforward application. I always encourage artists who are interested, um, please visit our, our website and uh, have a look at it. And if you're interested, you can contact me, be happy to answer any questions about the source directory. Under the new regulations, the source directory would be expanded to include these Indian businesses. Um, and in order to be able to sell their product as an Indian um, good, businesses would apply to the Indian Arts and Crafts Board um, for inclusion in this source directory. And they would provide uh, basic information about the business, their business plan, the product that they were selling, um, where it was being made, where the components of that product were coming from, all of those things that we just went over. Um, and the board would then be responsible for reviewing those applications. Um, if the board approved it, um, then that business is added to the source directory and they are granted the ability to use this trademark and label their products as a certified Indian product. Um, the proposed regulations are unclear as to whether individual artisans would be able to obtain and use that trademark as well, that certified Indian product. It is clear that these Indian businesses could use it. It's unclear if individual artists could receive the use of that trademark. There's no cost for that trademark. There's no cost for the application to the source directory for either individual artists or, or businesses. Okay, so next slide. Um, and so just examples of products that could be mass produced and sold as Indian products under the proposed new regulations. And the full regulations, they, they spell out a lot of these products. These are all pulled directly from the regulations themselves. So again, I'd encourage you um, to, to take a read at the regulations. I know it's a lot. Um, if anyone has questions, we're here to try to uh, help and answer those as much as possible. Um, but again, all of the standard products that, that we're used to seeing um, as Native American products, jewelry, basketry, weavings, regalia, woodwork, pottery. Um, but then also this large um, new group of items um, include uh, artisanal and craft agricultural products. So um, that could be everything from bison meat to wild rice. Um, uh, uh, or just raw materials, right? Also um, craft food products. So that could be a, a jerky, for example, might be something like that. And also artisanal or craft beverages. So teas, sodas, um, all of those under the new regulations um, would be able to be sold as Indian made products. Okay, um, next slide. And then these are, again, directly from the regulations. Um, here you can see the extent to which they have gone um, to spell out these new products that could be um, sold 
as, as Indian made products. Um, so dried beans, soup mix, spices, teas, um, uh, really sky's the limit um, under this group. Um, but these, the first group are, are sort of unprocessed products or minimally processed products, I think is a good way to think of them. Um, and then the second group would be more processed products. So ready to eat foods, um, packaged foods, things like that, um, beverages, coffee, tea, wine, and beers, um, as long as it doesn't still can't contain a federally controlled uh, substance there. And then also um, digital written and electronic media, including movies, TV shows, radio shows, podcasts, newspapers, magazines, um, books, comic materials, um, all would be able to be uh, marketed and sold as Indian made products under the new regulations. All right, I think we're ready for the next slide. Great. Um, so this is an important slide. This has the links and I think we'll be making all these links available um, in the chat. But three key links. One, there's a short press release um, that you can view on the DOI website. Um, the press release was released by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The proposed new regulations um, have been developed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Office of the Solicitor. Those are the attorneys um, for the Department of the Interior. Um, and also on the BIA website, you can see the full details, the full 18 pages um, of the proposed new IACA regulations. Um, and most importantly, the reason we're here today, right, are, is to encourage discussion um, among all the artisans here and how um, these changes in the law might affect them. But most importantly, um, we want to engage artists to provide feedback um, and comments uh, to the Department of the Interior. And those can be sent to the simple website, consultation at bia.gov, um, and they will be considering all those comments when they decide whether to move forward with the regulations as is or consider further um, modifications. Um, and one thing I just wanted to touch on too is that this, um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, it's quite an old law, 1935 is when it was originally created, um, but it has been amended several times um, over you know just the last few decades. It was unchanged for a long time. A really significant, the first significant change happened in 1990. Um, and that is when um, essentially the civil and criminal penalties for violating the act um, were increased quite significantly. And the at that time, the mission of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board changed. Prior to 1990, this law was on the books. No one was enforcing it, to be honest. Um, at post-1990, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board was tasked with beginning to enforce the law. Um, it took quite some time for that to kind of build up and gain traction. Um, and then there were a series of later amendments um, uh, to the regulations, essentially, in 2000 um, and 2010 as well, too. Um, as the board learned how to do law enforcement and worked with other federal agencies um, and secured additional funding. Um, if you follow uh, the, some of the news related to Indian Arts and Crafts and Act enforcement, um, you might have noticed that the last few years um, have brought a significant increase in successful prosecutions of violators of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Um, and that's directly related to an increase in funding that has been provided thanks to the New Mexico congressional delegation um, to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which is responsible for uh, the actual law enforcement investigations related to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. The board handles the complaints. We process those um, and kind of sort them and then turn over um, uh, complaints to Fish and Wildlife Service for investigation then that goes to the U.S. District Attorneys for prosecution. Okay, last slide, um, and perhaps the oh, two more slides. Sorry, um, this is uh, we can yeah we can just go straight to this one. The last one was just a screenshot, basically of the uh, of the website where you can read more of those links. Um, but there, the Department of Interior has created uh, and scheduled a series of consultation and listening sessions um, to go along with these proposed regulations. Um, we're to the tail end of that. 
Um, we've had four consultation sessions already, um, Las Vegas, Oklahoma City, Alaska, I'm forgetting one, um, Phoenix. Um, there are two left. Um, and these are perhaps the most important one. Session five, which is coming up August 2nd, is the only virtual session. So for those of you that can't attend one in person, and I recognize that's probably the vast majority of artists out there, I'd really encourage you to attend the August 2nd consultation session. Um, this is advertised as a tribal consultation only, um, but it is indeed open to members of the general public. So you can register just as an individual artisan. Um, you'll have to select the other category when you get into the registration, but please do um, take that opportunity. Um, and there will be representatives from the BIA there as well too, to provide information and answer questions um, about these new proposed regulations. And then the last listening session, consultation session, um, will be in conjunction with Santa Fe Indian Market um, on August 18th. Comments and feedback for this close on September 1st. So again, we're kind of at the end run here, um, just have another month, month and a half um, to ask questions of BIA and submit comments. Um, that is all the slides I have. I really appreciate the time and uh, the opportunity to share this information. I recognize it is a lot of information and very technical legal uh, jargon that most of us, I mean, I'm a museum curator, <laughs> not a legal expert. So it's a lot for all of us to process, but I've been working with this for 10 years. So um, would love to hear some comments and feedback from artists and, and hear artists um, share amongst themselves their feelings on it. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll stop talking. Yeah, thanks so much, Connor. Um, I think and, I, and thanks to the, the watchers, the listeners, I, we've seen some great questions and comments come in. Um, I, I do want to point out um, to our listeners, I think Connor will have some answers, as particularly around existing uh, legis the existing act. And we can we can just kind of have a con conversation about our understanding and Connor's understanding of the the um, proposed revisions, and we're hopefully setting all of us up to be able to provide that those ask those questions of the folks who have have written and proposed the new the new revisions. So we'll do our best to to share the questions and comments. And you know any kind of answers, and Janine, you feel free to jump in if you have any thoughts. Um, it looks like a lot of the questions um, might need to be answered as what what does it look like now, and what are the what how would it change, or what it, would it look like in the future uh, if these if these revisions pass or, or become law. The first question is from Christina, uh, and who just said, uh, in, yeah, it's popped up on the screen here. I'm getting a bit confused about the exclusions. I think this was when you were covering the current exclusions. Um, does this mean that it can be produced, but can't be labeled as Indian made? Like, a, and as a, an example, so mass produced items can't be labeled as Indian made like t-shirts. So, um, and maybe Connor, if you can address where it's at now and if there's any shift yes. that you see yes. in the here. Absolutely. And I think your example, just to reference your example, which I think helps clarify it for me. Um, if we're talking about the current act, that is correct. No mass produced items um, can be marketed, labeled or sold as an Indian made product under the current act. So definitely not a, a t-shirt um, or any other piece of clothing. Under the proposed new regulations, a t-shirt, a mass produced t-shirt could be labeled and sold as an Indian made product, provided it was made by a business that met the criteria of being at least 50% Native American owned, 50% of the profits went to Native Americans and day-to-day -day operations were controlled by one or more Native Americans. So I hope that answers your question. Does that seem clear? Thanks, Connor. Yeah. Um, we'll see. And I think we have a few specific examples like that that people are really curious about, mm -hmm. especially creatives who are working in different um, in different mediums as well. So 
yeah, the next question, Liz uh, asked specifically about music. Is that considered an art or, art or craft in the regulations? And if so, who's analyzing that? Who, who makes a decision currently and, and potentially in the future? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And that's one we get a lot. And um, the current, under the current regulations, um, no, music, dance, books, um, the act does not cover those. Um, and, and I think that's a, a, a comment concern that we get a lot um, from the public. Um, I think that's something that needs to be revisited. Um, I don't have a specific opinion on what the best way to handle that is, um, but I, the current act really only applies um, to kind of physical, visual arts and crafts, essentially, is, is kind of the way to think of it there. Um, under the new proposed new regulations, um, it does appear Again, it's, it's still a little bit unclear. There's a lot of information, but it does appear that yes, um, that those products, something like a CD of music, um, a, a website um, that could be labeled and sold as an Indian made product if it was made by an Indian owned business. It is unclear if those products would be able to be sold or marketed as an Indian made product if they were being made by individual artisans. So, and again, I, I tried to touch on this, but I know it's, I acknowledge it's fairly confusing, right? Is that essentially these new regulations, they basically keep things the same for current individual artisans producing their own products, what it's doing is creating this whole new category, the Indian business category, that can sell a very broad range of mass produced products as Indian made products and attach a trademark to them, a big label is the easiest way to think of it, that identifies that as an Indian made product. All right, thanks, Connor. That, that's oh, helpful. Oh, yeah. And and um, just a, reflecting on that, and thank you, Connor, and great question, Liz. And I think at the end, we'll give um, a framework um, of how we can give feedback to, to um, the BIA about this, because it's a great question about music and the performing mm -hmm. arts and how will artists be impacted by that. So thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, Janine. Uh, connected to that, this is you know a, 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 a medium question and then a, an additional question mm -hmm. from Marlena. Just points out that, that number 17 lists uh, digital written electronic media and the question is, if someone produces media, so like a book, and claims to be native but can't show proof of descent or it, or enrollment, um, are they in violation? Is that is that how it would apply to to those sorts of mediums? Can you repeat that again for me, Peter? Thanks. Okay, I'm going to read it straight from Marlena. It says, if someone produces media such as a book and claims to be Native American but isn't enrolled, nor can show proof of descent, are they in violation of the IACA? Is that how it applies to those forms of media? Yeah, so, and again, I, if I'm understanding the correction question correctly, under the current act regulations, unfortunately, they do not cover materials like a book or a song. So, someone can and and i will acknowledge i think this is a a hole in the current regulations um someone could claim to be you know a member of a tribe or native american um and there there is no provision under the existing act to prosecute people um for that violation um, under these proposed new regulations Again, there, there is no provision or change for individual artisans. Um, the, the change is for this Indian business. So if you did have a 
business organization producing a book or music and labeling it as an Indian product, um, they would be in violation of the act then under these new regulations, but it doesn't address the individual artisan group. All right. There's another, the next question from Alicia just says, just to clarify, are the new proposed changes suggesting that anyone wanting to market their work as Indian made will have to seek the trademark from IACB in order to be compliant with the law? Or is it an additional option for organizations and individual artists to market their project product? Yeah. Great question. So the new regulations, again, for an individual artist or craftsperson, making their own products, they do not need to seek any kind of sort of under the current regulations or the new regulations. They do not need to seek any kind of certification or approval with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. As long as you meet the definition of Indian under the act, so enrolled member of federal or state recognized tribe or a certified Indian artisan, you are free to label um, your product as a product of your tribe um, or a Native American, Alaska Native, um, product. Um, under the current regulations, no business can even has an option for selling their product um, as an Indian made product, unless those products, if you have a gallery, for example, right, that's selling exclusively products made by individual Native American artists, then yes, they can label those products and market them. Um, but you cannot sell a mass produced product in any ma manner under the current regulations. Um, under the new regulations, to you would be required in order to sell a mass produced product as Indian made. Yes, you do then have to go through the certification process with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, submit a source directory application um, and receive approval. Okay, and a quick follow-up question was, what is the cost of that certification and how long would it take to become a certified business under the new, the proposed great. regulations? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's no cost for, um, there's no cost for inclusion in the source directory, either under our current regulations or the new regulations. So that's the good news. Um, in terms of how long it takes to process an application, um, I'll be very honest and say right now in our central office, we have two people who process, um, to, uh, who are responsible for processing these. We don't get very many applications. We'd love to get more. Um, and it usually on average takes a couple of weeks, two to three weeks to process an application now. The proposed new regulations do not specify a time frame for how long the process of certification would take. Um, it's unknown how many applications might be coming in um, if these regulations were to go into effect. Um, it's also unclear if any additional resources, and by that I mean staff resources, would be provided um, to the Indian Arts and Crafts Board to process additional applications. So it's difficult to say how long the process would take under these new regulations. Thanks. Um, yeah, the, we'll go, jump to that one. There's a quick question about, is the source directory available for state recognized tribal artists? That is a good question. I would have to double check on that, but I do not believe it is. And, and I'll explain why, because this is a little bit, it was confusing for me when I started with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, because, and I'll use our exhibition program at, our ex exhibition program as an example, right? So all of our museums host rotating exhibits for um, Native American artists. However, we can, even though a state recognized tribal member is certainly free to sell their artwork uh, as Indian made under the act, our museums are not able to provide exhibition opportunities to state recognized artists. And that is because the Department of the Interior as a whole, right, BIA is the same way, can only provide federal resources and use federal resources with federally recognized tribes. Okay, thanks, Connor. 
I did see a question from um, Pat Pruitt who asked, would you be able to host an online listening session for artists? Every session you have held in conjunction with other events when most artists are working during those sessions and it's next to impossible to attend. In addition to answering his question, maybe this is a great opportunity to talk about the um, where these uh, revisions are coming from and who, who scheduled those meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you, Peter. Um, yes, I think it would be wonderful to host some additional online listening sessions for artists. Um, and that's one reason that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board has been trying to work um, on, on programs like this. Um, and I think I touched on this before, but just to clarify um, that these proposed new regulations have been developed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, and uh, deputy secretaries in the Bureau of Indian Affairs working in conjunction with the attorneys at the Department of the Interior. Um, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board did not have significant input in developing and proposing these new regulations or in scheduling the listening sessions. And I certainly recognize that it is challenging for artists um, to attend them in person, and there are very limited virtual options, um, which again is why we have been trying to do um, some of these events um, just to share as much information with artists as possible. Um, I think that would be a great opportunity to, pro again, provide comments. Uh, there's no, um, you know, it's still unclear um, what happens after September 1st when the comment period closes. There's no clear timeline yet for um, when these regulations might go into place, if they would go into place. In general, the way that the federal government would operate is they would, uh, after the um, public comment period, um, theoretically re take those comments into consideration, make some revisions to the regulations, put them back out again, and we kind of go through this process all over again. Um, this is a very significant change, the most significant change to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act in 90 years, right? Um, and I think we had some comments on our previous session um, with Racing Magpie. There was a, a particularly insightful one from an artist about how um, there's a need for greater consultation with tribal governments as well too in this process, as well as individual artisans. Um, and that each tribe um, is gonna be unique, right? Um, and there might not be a, a blanket one size fits all solution here. Um, so it's certainly our hope that um, this process will proceed um, proceed with extensive additional consultation and feedback um, from tribal members and citizens. Great, thanks, Connor. Here's another question, kind of a specific question about a medium or a, a pro produced um, item. Felicia asked, where would white sage smudge bundles fall? in current and, and proposed revisions? Yeah, um, under the current, the current act does not cover a product like that. Um, I am fairly sure, I, I know that that would be covered under the new regulations um, as a product that could be sold um, as an Indian made product, again, by a, a business. Um, and it's under that agricultural products category. I'm kind of flipping to see if I can specifically find it, but I do know that there was, if not Sage specifically mentioned in there, something very similar. Um, so I'm sure that that could, could qualify um, as an Indian made product under the new regulations. And, and just to clarify, so that it would, it would qualify as Indian made product for a business. What about for an individual, if they were to sell um, white sage smudge bundles, would yeah, that be allowed under question. the new? It does not appear under my understanding of it, that an individual artisan um, would be able to, to market a sage bundle as an Indian made product under the new regulations. And then a follow up another another question kind of about materials and about the the requirement that they're US produced from Lorraine Lorraine Pearson said hi Connor I'm an individual that does embroidery work. 
Um, my materials are fabric, thread, et cetera, which likely aren't made in the United States. I've been embroidering denim jackets, which are likely not made in the U.S. I also get most of my work framed. What does that mean for my work? Would that framing need to adhere as well? Yeah. Hi, Lori. I hope you're doing great. Um, that's a great question. Um, that would not, uh, that stipulation that the products themselves, the components um, need to be made in the United States, that does not apply for individual artisans. That is only for this category of Indian businesses, right? So under the current regulations, nothing for you to worry about. Under the new regulations, nothing for you to worry about. Um, and again, I think, I, not to beat a dead horse, but I think this is an important message to get across is that the new regulations, there's not a significant change for how individual artisans are, are operating as they are today, right? It's this whole, it's this new category that's being created. Um, and so we just want artists to think about that and consider how that might impact them and their own work and livelihood um, of having this new group of Indian businesses um, that would be 50, minimum 50% owned and, and minimum 50% of profits going to those Indian owners um, that could sell mass produced products as an Indian made product. That's the key component of these new regulations. So I think we've had so many great comments. I want to thank all of you for joining. I think, uh, and if, if more pop up, we can come. I think we're kind of heading towards the end of our originally scheduled 30 minutes. But um, after this, I just saw one pop up. And after that, we'll, we'll kind of go a little bigger picture and ask about, there are a couple of questions about like, what is this, how does this all fit into this this current act? And then we'll move into like some opportunities for action that and how we can maybe help people send their feedback to to the BIA. Um, I saw Marlena did a did a quick follow up to say, could an individual apply for the trademark as a business if they're registered as a single member LLC? That kind of ties together some of these questions about the difference between a business and an individual artist. Yeah. yeah. That is a good question. And I do believe, yes, that if, if an individual single ownership LLC um, formally incorporated as a business under, you know, state, federal or tribal law, um, that yes, they could certainly uh, apply for listing in the source directory and receive use of that certification uh, and trademark. So great question. And I see Pat followed right up with that a question of some individual artists are incorporated and or operate as a business and where would that follow and fall under current and proposed regulations? So some, some uh, same question. Yeah, I think the, yeah. Um, the under the current regulations, um, there's no issue if the artist um, is operating a business. If, if it's an individual artist um, who meets the definition of Indian under the current act, um, they are certainly free to form a, a business or LLC and continue to market um, their work as, as a Native American product or, or American Indian product. Um, no problems under the current regulation. And I think we kind of answer that also under the new regulation, they can certainly continue to do that. And then would also receive the, the ability to use um, the trademark, the, the certified Indian product under the, the trademark, under the new regs. Thanks. I also saw someone was asking, Christina was asking how to get a hold of Connor and do some more sessions like this for to make sure that we reach more and more artists. I, I, my quick response is please share our current, <laughs> share the recording from Racing Magpie's first session with Connor and this one. I mean, that might be a great way is to just, is to um, share that out and, and, and spread the news and get more artists to watch these and get them curious and get them sending feedback to the, to the BIA. And Connor, if you have any other response to that as well. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I might not have my contact information, but I could certainly add that. Um, we can make that available. Um, but I think the key component here to, I mean, I'd be happy to answer individual questions, but the important takeaway again is comments need to go to the, B, the consultation email um, that the BIA has set up. Thank you. And then, so now um, there's a question here from Maniba that just, that talks about, it's confusing in the current, between the current regulations and the proposed new regulations, but how is the truth and mark, how is it truth and marketing to let arts and crafts made by non-Indians be marketed as Indian products through the, the new regulations? Or do you have any response to that at all? Uh, my response is that is a very good question. <laughs> okay. And I would, that would be an excellent comment to provide in the consultation process. Right. That sounds like a question for the folks who, who wrote from the BIA who wrote it. Um, man, I just lost it. So I think, I think there's a really great comment here from, um, Oh my, from Hillary Kempinich, mm -hmm. who just said, I joined late and just, just starting to hear about everything here. But one thought that Hillary had was, would it be possible to have different categories under native, like native made, native design, native owned? Not all indigenous artists have accessibility to a majority of apprentices, reproducers, et cetera, that are indigenous. Um, yeah. And I think that is a really insightful comment, Hillary. And, and again, I think um, would encourage, that's the exact kind of comment and feedback that we're sort of looking for in this process. Um, so would kind of encourage you again to, to submit that comment because I do think there are um, nuances here that might have been overlooked in the initial draft. Um, and. I think that's the um, highlights the importance of these consultations and providing feedback, getting receiving feedback from the public, um, and and adapting um, any regulations to make sure that they really work for everybody, uh, because there is no one size fits all uh, solution here. So, really great comment. Yeah, and I think that leads, we're, we're right at time here, really, we can kind of wrap up uh, this session. But one thing we want to encourage folks to do is to reach out with great ideas like Hillary's and questions like you all asked here. Um, Janine, would you mind just, do you mind touching on ways that we, we, we as a collective might be able to support um, individual artists and businesses to, to reach back and, and um, how we could do that? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, this is so great and I love all these questions and thank you, Connor. I know it's like, oh, you're in the hot spot. <laughs> so thank you <laughs> for just navigating all this. And we had some great questions and I feel like there could be a lot more questions coming out of this, but um, on behalf of Maniba and through our Minnesota Native Alliance Artists Alliance program, feel free to follow us on Facebook or message us directly on social media. Um, um, we do have some templates out there for folks, specifically for artists, individual artists and organizations. If you need a template of what, how would I frame what I'm trying to say, you know, or just to get some ideas about how you could communicate any feedback or thoughts or more questions to that BIA email address by um, by September 1st of the deadline. So feel free to reach out to us on social media um, or um, we, we also can shoot me an email or Peter directly if you have any questions just about how we could support you with articulating your questions further. Um, I know Maniba plans to do some more conversation and um, uh, host a conversation about the proposed new regulations around the agricultural products. So that, that's a new area that's being proposed, which hasn't been done before. And so just offering more insight and awareness and um, about that as well. So feel, we're going to be posting all of that on social media. So if you hit us up, we have two pages, the Minnesota Native Artists Alliance and the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance will be unified in our marketing around this, um, but feel free to follow us there. 
if that's helpful. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And we just want to encourage all of you to continue the conversation. Keep thinking about it. Keep talking to other artists um, and share those thoughts. Don't don't just sit on them. Share them with with uh, the BIA. They need to hear from us. Um, like I said at the top, the the current act and the and the revisions affect the way you all do business and the way that you're allowed that you can market things. And it's important that you have a voice in it as well. Mm -hmm. So we really want to keep this conversation going. Um, keep an eye on our social media, all of our social medias to just track as we're able to make those those um, those form letters or you know just just ideas around those available to you all. There have been links getting posted in the in the chat um, in multiple ways. So you can go and read the revisions for yourself and you can go to Indian Arts and Crafts Board's current website to look at the current um act as well um and stay in touch we're we're all in this figuring it out together and um really grateful for all your time today connor and all the time of all the all the folks viewing and janine thanks for being here and to pamela for helping to coordinate this and skylar behind the scenes um any final words connor or janine before we wrap up um, I just wanted to thank everyone again um, for coming and appreciate uh, Peter and Janine and Neva and um, Racing Magpie and all of their time and attention to this important matter. As I said, uh, as Peter said, I think there's a lot, a lot to unpack here, um, a lot to discuss. And so we hope artists will um, continue to talk amongst themselves, uh, provide feedback. Um, we really see, I know the Indian Arts and Crafts Board um, sees the act and, and the regulations as a way to uh, advance Native American artists and help them. Um, and we certainly want to ensure that any changes um, to the regulations um, would only help artists um, and not impact their, their livelihoods and, and their um, professions. So thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we look forward to getting more feedback from artists. So please do reach out. We can make a difference. You know, as artists, we have power. So thank you so much, Connor, for your great presentation, Peter, for hosting and being the DJ and all this. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to continued conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks. Okay.